Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Before we commence today's proceedings, I have a couple of housekeeping items, if you don't mind. Firstly, for anyone who does have a mobile phone, and I assume it would be the majority of people here, could we ask you to please either turn it off or I'll switch it to a silent mode as a courtesy to the speakers? Today's event will run for um, about an hour and three quarters with a break for lunch at 12 o'clock. You have hopefully all received programs, and in the programs you will see the timing for this morning's presentations, as well as information about our speakers. And if time permits, well, we may invite questions from the audience at the end of the speakers' uh, talks, um, and if not, you'll have the opportunity to speak with them during the lunch break. The forum is being videoed and a link will be available at the QBI website for people to watch after the event. So I might remind everybody to be on their very best behaviour because you will be seen. Um, bathrooms are located out this door and alongside the auditorium there are lifts and also the bathrooms are on the right hand side of the lifts. Lunch will be served on our terrace area at 12 midday outside the auditorium. For anyone who has special dietary requirements, we have catered for you and please see the meals that are labelled. In the event that we do have a fire alarm, and it sounds this morning, please follow my instructions. The fire exits are located past the elevators and all of our QBI staff who are here today will assist anyone who may need um, help with mobility. So please, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Pank Yassar, who is the director of the Queensland Brain Institute. Well, thanks so much, Evelyn. Uh, look, for those of you who haven't met Evelyn, Evelyn's our new director of external engagement, and uh, uh, I'm sure she'll be meeting everyone during the day. So welcome, everyone, to the Clem Jones uh, Public Dementia Forum, our annual event, and it's, it's great to see you know, so many people I've met many, many times here before, and it's lovely to have you all back. And it's great to see some babies in the room. You know, it's good to start early. <laughs> Hear about these things and get to know them. You know, the earlier you start, the better it is, really. And look, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners, the, the Tarawal and the Jagera people, who are the traditional owners of this land on which the QBI is and where we meet today, and acknowledge their elders, uh, past, present, and those to come. So welcome everyone to the QBI, and uh, especially welcome back to um, people who've been here many, many times before and, and keep coming back. It's great to see you all. Uh, in particular, our keynote sp speaker, Pat Welch, who's the Seven Network Sports Editor, and uh, he's the ambassador for Dementia Australia. So we look forward to hearing you know, his thoughts and, and his personal experiences there. Professor Len Gray, who Len's been here before, several times as well, who's co-chair of the Brisbane Diamantina Health Partners aging theme. And Brisbane Diamantina Health Partners is a, 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 I guess a consortium was created in Brisbane to bring together clinicians and, and scientists in this area, which is one area where I think Brisbane really uh, has, uh, you know, not worked so well. And, and, and our centre, the Clem Jones Centre, is certainly one space where we're working very hard to maintain this. And you know, your presence here really helps that hugely. Uh, Professor Tim Dunn, who is UQ's Pro Vice Chancellor for the Provost, and thanks, Tim. Great to see you here. Uh, Lee Diffie, I don't know if Lee's here yet, but Lee Diffie from state government, who, who will be arriving here. Ema Niels, who's on the CJ Cadra Advisory Board, and uh, Ema also is a, is a long-time partner of QBI. And many of our QBI supporters, who are intended, in, in particular David Muir and uh, David Johnson, who I don't see here yet, I guess he's showing up soon. Lean and Bobby Brazil, who are all time friends, have been here quite a few times. And Robin Hilton and Janice Strathworth, thank you so much. And lovely to see you all here. So QBI, for those who don't know, and I'm sure you've heard me say this so many times, was, you know, we're now 16 years old. We were established in 2003 and started really with about 25 people and have grown and established to be a center with nearly 450 people and, you know, working in this lovely building and the building next door. 
And, and really, uh, dementia was one of the areas we recognized pretty early, and Perry Bartlett, who was the founding director, Perry and I talked about this very early in the scheme of things. And uh, Jürgen, who we eventually recruited as to head up the Clem Jones Center, uh, was one of the early visitors here in Cape to give a talk, and it was pretty clear to us, you know, he was invited up here to, as, as a leader in this area, and we were at that time, no, we knew then, you know, exactly what the, what the, the turmoil that comes from dementia and the fact there's really no cures for this really terrible disease. And it is one of the great challenges today. And as you all know, I'm sure everyone here in the room has seen the statistics. This is a growing problem in our society. And really, you know, the impact on people with dementia is one thing, but of course it affects absolutely everybody, the families, the friends, everyone. And in fact, the effect on families and friends is often much more devastating than it is. And it's an area which we really need some cures for. And as we all get older, you know, there's a pretty high chance that quite a large fraction of us are going to be suffering some aspect of dementia. So given the sobering picture, you know, thinking about QBI and the Clem Jones Center, I think we have a pretty crucial role to play in this space. And we've set up and grown and it's nearly 80 people now within the center and has been supported splendidly by, you know, people like yourselves, donations, both state and federal governments, and the University of Queensland, of course. You know, we've been hugely supported from all sides, and from that has come a really vibrant centre which is looking and establishing new areas of research. So on that note, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jürgen Goetz, who's the director of the Clem Jones Centre. So, Jürgen. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I will keep it short. My talk will be longer. <laughs> So let me first thank Professor Saf, not only for his support of this event, but in particular also for his support of CJ Cadra. He referred to the size of, of, CJ, uh, of, of the Queensland Brain Institute with 450 staff. I have been recruited in 2012 when the Clem Jones Center has been set up with seed funding from the Clem Jones Foundation, for which we are extremely grateful. And uh, the Clem Jones Center for Aging Dementia Research has since grown to approximately 90 people. So we have 10 teams, and as you are aware, of, we are highly, highly productive. And then a few years ago, we have set up this Public Dementia Forum, which is actually great for us because we get a sense of what's happening out there, and we get in touch with the community. We get to hear about these heartbreaking stories, but also of these stories full of hope and courage. And it's, it's always a terrific event, not only for us, but hopefully also for you who are visiting and coming here to this event. So we have this now for the fifth time, and we're always changing the format a bit. So we have to see how we go this time. We, we try our best to communicate what we are doing in the labs. And so we have a series of talks. And as I said, I will keep it short. It's now my pleasure to introduce our MC. Professor Sa has already made a short introduction, so Evelyn Moore is, um, is the Deputy Director for External Engagement. She is relatively new to the Institute, so I think it gives us a great opportunity to get to know you further, to get, for all of you to get to know her, and I'm sure you will have many, many more contacts in, in the near and far future. So Evelyn, please come to the stage. Thanks for that. Thank you, Jürgen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker today, and it's someone known to all of you, Mr. Pat Welsh, who is the sports editor from the Sydney uh, Network in Brisbane. Pat recently celebrated 40 years with the network, and he's a popular and trusted figure across Brisbane and to his legion of fans. Now in partnership with Dementia Australia, Pat uses his media profile to bring much needed awareness to brain health and in the community, encouraging ongoing discussion about dementia and making a difference to the lives of people with dementia, but also to their families and to their carers. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pat. Thank you, Evelyn. I see you got those couple of little notes that Mum sent down from Bundaberg. It's my of intro. Um, just before I refer to my speech, a couple of uh, general observations. Um, 
For those of you watching the tennis on the Seven Network last night, I had no responsibility for the decision to stay with the Curios match and not go to uh, our new world number one. So please don't phone me. The phone's been ringing off the hook this morning. It wasn't my fault. I was trying to watch little Ash Barty as well. Um, look, I, I looked at the introduction. I was slightly embarrassed when... Uh, I looked around me that uh, give up, you're completely surrounded by doctors and professors and some of the great medical minds in the country. And I said, what the hell do they want with a fat ageing sports commentator in the middle of all this? But look, I do have uh, experience with dementia, sadly, uh, on my dad's side. It's been 25 years, almost to the month that we lost him. And um, I'll come with, with a few facts and figures from Dementia Australia, but I, I thought if I could today, share my personal story with dementia in, in the hope that, I don't know, maybe it can help, maybe it uh, inspires some of our researchers. I look across and see the, uh, the motto, together we're closing in on a cure for dementia. I mean, wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that just be wonderful in our lifetime if we could see it? But as I said, I, I come loaded with plenty of facts and figures, most of them disturbing from my colleagues at Dementia Australia who I might add speak lavishly of the work done here at QBI and I've just been listening just by speaking to some of the very proud staff here of the vast body of work that is done out of this very centre and it's something that you can all be very proud of and I feel privileged that I've been allowed to, to speak with you today. I've learnt a little bit that the Clem Jones Centre focuses on understanding how the brain functions both in health and in disease. So. That's obviously critical, but with no effect, effective treatments or cures yet available, as we all know for dementia, understanding how things work and then identifying treatment targets will be the way that advancements are made. So I also know that the Clem Jones Centre, since its establishment just eight years ago now, includes 90 scientists, postgraduate students, technicians, representing significant dementia research capacity, significant not only on an Australian level, but I think it's fair to say on a global scale as well. And I understand many of the researchers have been attracted from great institutions right around the world. So we've got them working right here in Brisbane. So firstly, can I say on behalf of Dementia Australia, um, pass on our heartfelt thanks for giving me a voice today just to tell my story. Thank you for providing hope and making a difference to the lives of people of all ages, living with all forms of dementia, their families and carers. And obviously I fit into one of those categories and obviously the future generations who will be impacted. I'm speaking clearly to a room laden with knowledge on all matters dementia, so you'll forgive me for stealing some of our stats today from Dementia Australia. I'm aware my brief is to touch on my personal experiences, which I might say is the major reason for me happily agreeing to assume the ambassadorial role with Dementia Australia when I was approached. It's already gifted me a new circle of friends at the recent memory walk, I was hanging around with the Veronicas, who I think you all know and have read that uh, their mum is sadly affected by dementia at the moment. So suddenly I've gone from the 62-year-old sitting in the sports department to the new cool kid around the newsroom. <laughs> all the young journos want to know me, what were they like? Were they friendly? I know they were. They, were. they were fantastic and they are so caring about their mum. They, they obviously leave, you know, lead an incredibly busy life and they literally put on hold a trip to the US for promotions for their new albums, and I'm not even sure what you call it these days, but CDs, et cetera, so they could, so they could do the memory walk with Dementia Australia and be involved and just, you know, use their profile to, to help out. But in my side of it, my dad, Lenny, I lost him, or we lost him 25 years ago. He was 76. It's a hole in our hearts, obviously, that will never be filled. And it's a cliche, I know, but it just taught us to cherish those close and spend as much time and give them as much love as you can because I'm not proud to admit there was, uh, there's been a bit of recent tension in the family with uh, the matriarch who is now 88. Um, I was running late as usual the other day. I had to call her. Seven Network are in the throes of early development of assembling their team for the Tokyo Olympics next year. Uh, given that this changed world that we live in, security, etc., the Seven Network needed a few more intimate details from birth certificates and that. I called Mum in Bundaberg, who had those details. Mum was running late for bingo. I was running late. 
there was a small clash over the phone and after she'd been looking through cupboards and drawers, she said, Patrick, what do you want this for? And I, I was a little bit short, I must admit, with my, the 88. She only just turned 88. She was 87 when this happened. And uh, I said, Mum, look, I said, it's as simple as this. I'm running late with this stuff. I needed it in yesterday to our network heads. But effectively, if they bring me home from Tokyo on a body bag, there's about six million in it for you. And she said, don't be speaking like that, Patrick. That's ridiculous. And then there was this sudden pause. She said, how much? <laughs> So it's just been a little tense, just a little tense between Bundaberg and Brisbane at the moment, but that'll be solved on Saturday because if I haven't phoned with the race tips by 11.15 on Saturday morning, there's a serious danger of me, of a red line appearing through my name in the will. Uh, brother and sister get the lot. Um, look, the tiffs happened, but back to Dad, despite the fact that I, I left home at 18 to pursue my sports reporting career, he was a massive influence. He played footy and cricket, so did my brother and I. Uh, he worked his backside off to give his family a good life, and for that, I'm obviously eternally grateful. He was working underground in the mines at Mount Morgan in his early teens. He fought in World War II in PNG for five years in the prime of his life. He fell from an electricity pole while working for the local version of Sequeb in Bundaberg, did, did irreparable damage to his legs, nearly lost one. Yet he would still, in pain, come out and try and help the kids in the backyard, coaching us with our footy or cricket. He was our hero. Lenny didn't deserve to go the way he did, but in this room I think we all know dementia's cruel, it's ruthless, it's relentless and it plays no favourites. So at this point, cue the stats, I think. It's the second leading cause of death in Australians. 5.8% of deaths in males, 11.3% in females... And as recently as 2016, it was the leading cause of death among Australian women, surpassing heart disease, which had been number one cause in both male and females in the early 20th century. In 2017, dementia remained the leading cause of death in females and the third leading cause in males, overall deaths in excess of 13,000. In 2019, there were almost 450,000 Australians living with dementia, and that number is exploding, sadly. Growing at over 200 a day, it'll be more than twice that figure within three decades. To extrapolate those numbers, Dementia Australia believes 1.5 million are currently living or involved, living with or caring for someone with dementia. It's costing the economy 15 billion. It's staggering, it's scary and it's sad. Alarmingly, without a medical breakthrough, the number of people with dementia will keep increasing dramatically. In fact, We'll be at almost 600,000 by 2028 and easily topping a million by 2053. I can stand here and quote the figures and the stats all day, but I think you all understand the magnitude of the problem we face. I know broadly dementia describes a loss of memory, intellect, rationality, social skills, physical functioning. And we know it comes in many forms. In my case, it was the physical functions which first betrayed my dad's problems. Although, in hindsight, after long discussions with Mum, the symptoms have been evident for some time. I often reflect that, selfishly, in my younger years, my job trapped me here in Brisbane, and when I wasn't in the southeast, I was travelling overseas. I was living a lifestyle sort of befitting the times, the extravagant 80s when Christopher Scase was spending other people's money. But when I finally got time to spend some good time at home, Dad's slip into the depths of dementia was dramatic. One morning, I was home, midwinter. I, I don't have to work to school holidays or anything like that. Mum was shopping and I saw Dad on the front veranda wetting himself. Shocked, I, I, instantly I berated him and then instantly I regretted it. And I told Mum and she insisted it was a first and I quickly found out that wasn't true because it happened the next day. And she, I'm certain she said that to us because she was aware that Dad needed full-time care, but she didn't want to let him go. There was only the two of them there. They'd been together 40 years. And she vowed in sickness and in health. It was only with deep discussions with Mum later that I learned how serious Dad's problems had become. He was our hero, obviously. As I mentioned, he'd spent five years in PNG in the Second World War, yet he rarely spoke about it. I never once saw an argument at home we weren't wealthy, but we were rich in family. Dad encouraged us to be sports mad, joined as much as we could, even with his bung, bung leg. 
And mum reluctantly revealed after we lost him just how alarming the de degeneration had become. Sometimes in his sleep, he'd lash out, occasionally hitting mum with a flailing arm. She was certain his mind was taking him back to the times of him fighting in the jungles in PNG. She refused to tell anyone. Eventually this, combined with the physical degeneration, the decision was taken out of mum's hand. Dad was now living in a cloud. He was sent full, for full-time care and it broke mum's heart. The nurses and carers, I've got to say, in Bundaberg were just wonderful. They knew who I was. Every night they'd turn Dad's TV on in his room and they'd say, look, there's Paddy reading the news. And yet when I came home and I was coming home as regularly as I could, I was only ever greeted by a blank stare or the very occasional glimmer of a smile. My heart was broken. In one of his final acts, we bought him a brand new suit for my sister Kathy's wedding. We, he couldn't attend, but we came to him, the entire wedding party, for photos. It was a day we'll never forget, and it was a day, sadly, that he'll never remember. We lost him shortly after. It was two years preceding. Those two and three years certainly weren't easy for Mum, and we, you know, I've since found out how hard it was. In those times, there was nothing like this. There was no QBI, there was no Clem Jones, there was no forensic examination of what and how it happened. She thinks that possibly it went back to war. She thinks possibly it was, you know, a legacy of his football days. But no one really knows. But I can tell you not long after we laid Dad to rest, my long-time work companion at Channel 7, Jack Newton, came to me with queries about dementia. Jack, as many of you in this room would know, was one of our greatest golfers. He finished second to Seve at, at Augusta National. He was beaten in an 18-hole playoff by Tom Watson at Carnoustie. He was at the absolute elite level. You know his career was tragically cut short by an airplane propeller. But he'd seen me and uh, the angst that I'd gone through with Dad. And he came to me one afternoon after we'd finished working in Melbourne and we were having a beer back at the hotel and he said, he said, I've got to tell you, Dad's got early stage dementia. And Jack's dad, who I knew very well because he, he idolised Jack, he travelled with him globally. He was a big, big man. He was probably six foot six, six foot seven. He was a copper in King's Cross when King's Cross was wild. He'd kick the kids up the backside and get home and get them off the streets. He had it. And I said, Jack, as cruel and as harsh as this sounds, I just said, I hope he goes quickly because I've seen what mum's had to endure. And he didn't take that as a slight. He didn't take that as an insult. He knew exactly where I was coming from. And he lost his father fairly quickly. And I said, Jack, it was merciful. It had taken him quickly. Some of the stories and the words I know are harsh today, but I say again, we know dementia plays no favourites. Am I worried? Of course I'm worried. I'm my father's son. Uh, that's why I try and follow some of the rules that Dementia Australia or the, or the advice that Dementia Australia give. I get to the gym a couple of days a week. I know I went as soon as I stand out from behind this lectern, it may not be patently evident. <laughs> but I do remind you we're in the dead of winter. The very, the very nature of my job, thankfully, ensures that I'm pretty mentally active 24-7. And I'm cognizant of that. I do my crosswords and puzzles. I love them. And I hope, obviously, to avoid this scourge. But I stand here simply as someone with a small profile in our community, someone who's been touched by dementia and resented it. I know significant advancements have been made and we're making further inroads every day, but clearly we need more. Can I refer quickly to my Dementia Australia notes again? In 2015, the Feds gave us 20 million or 200 million over five years for dementia research. They also established the National Institute for Dementia Research. One of the pressing issues is to build capacity in the dementia research sector by supporting students and early career dementia researchers. Dementia Australia Research Foundation, supported by public donations, plays a major role in this effort and funds a number of new and early, care, early career researchers through scholarships and project grants. So let me leave you with this. Dementia affects already 50 million worldwide. Every three seconds, someone in the world, world de develops dementia, I should say. Two out of three globally believe there's little or no understanding of dementia. Total worldwide costs 
over $1,000 billion. In fact, if dementia were a country, it would be the world's 18th largest economy. The stats make for a sobering and very sad read. The reality of living with dementia for those affected and their carers is even more confronting, which I'm certain many in this room can attest. I think all that's left to add to the researchers, especially those involved here with Clem Jones and with the QBI and all their teams involved in research around dementia, all I can say is Godspeed. Thank you. I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Please don't ask about Ash Barty and Nick Curios. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would there be any questions for Pat or else you can join him? I'm, you're joining us for the, the lunch outside? I'm hoping, hoping to. to. Yeah, look, I've just got to check with work. Of course. I'll see how much trouble I am in up there. But... <laughs> we'll see. Okay, thank you so much. Pleasure. And thank you for your support as well. That's okay. Thank you. I'd like to introduce our next speaker this morning, Professor Len Gray. Uh, Len will be known to many of you um, as he has presented at various forums and holding multiple roles within the University of Queensland. In addition to his role as co-chair of the Diamenta Health Partners Aging Theme, Len is the director of UQ's Centre for Health Services Research within the Faculty of Medicine, located at the Princess Alexandra Hospital. Prior to assuming this role, he directed both the Centre for Online Health and the Centre for Research in Geriatric Medicine, both of which have been incorporated into the new CHSR at the Princess Alexandria Hospital campus. Len is a specialist geriatrician who has also held several senior public health management positions. His research interests focus on aged care policy, models of aged care service delivery, assessment and care planning systems, and in recent years, e-health and the telemedicine strategies. Len holds a number of significant research grants and holds board and committee membership in Australia and internationally. We're privileged to have Len join us today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Len Gray. Thank you very much um, <clears throat> to the Institute for inviting me, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, to Jürgen in particular, who's asked me back again after I spoke here a couple of years ago. I'm talking about something very different today than I did then. Uh, Brisbane Diamantina Health Partners, uh, just to mention it in passing, uh, is very interested in this topic that I'm talking about today. It's one of the themes that we've sought to uh, tackle locally as a, as a major issue and a concern for people with dementia, and I'll talk about that particular aspect today. Uh, but we do have a number of themes of work that we're pursuing that, that really focus on how we can bring research capability into real practice here and now, and that's, that's really the purpose of BDHP. Jürgen and I are active researchers, we kind of compete for the same pot of money. And one of the big dilemmas that we, that we have to confront amongst our... Oh, we're good friends with each other. I'm, I'm not ready to shoot him just yet. But uh, one of the dilemmas we have when we think about dementia is, you know, where, where do we focus our efforts? Are we going to... Um, what about providing care for people now and how best to do that? while we wait for Jürgen and his team to prevent and cure dementia? And how do we balance the investment between what we do today for people with real needs today against the possibility that we may be able to fix the problem convincingly in the next decade or beyond? I think Jürgen's thinking a decade. Uh, some of us are thinking maybe three decades. However, that is, that is a balancing act that we all have to confront. Both of these perspectives on research are incredibly important, of course, and for people uh, who, like myself who are getting older, we're starting to think not so much about the cure but the, you know, how can we cope with this problem when we're confronted with it. But, of course, the, these are, these are the, the issues that policymakers have to re wrestle with. So let me start with a pretend case study. I'm a geriatrician. I've been seeing people with dementia for 40 years now, it used to be senility. Then we had a bit of 
senile dementia of Alzheimer's type. And then we had Alzheimer's. So we've seen a, an emergence of awareness and science around dementia in my career that's been really positive. It was really not even recognised as a problem when I started as a geriatrician. So let's think about a, an 89-year-old man we'll call Mr. AB. Let's get this clicker. Who has some sort of degree of Parkinson's disease and mild cognitive impairment and somewhat frail. And he falls over at home accidentally, as this kind of person is wont to do. And as a result, he's unable to walk, having previously used a walker. And he's in some degree of pain, not, not excruciating, but some degree of pain. And this is a story that many of you will have heard from somebody if you haven't experienced it yourself. So he's brought to the hospital emergency department by ambulance, having not been able to get up off the floor. Uh, he, he needs some sorting out, obviously. And so what's the problem here? This, the, the medical world thinks about diagnoses. So let's think about what might come. So he has some imaging, a variety of tests, and no fracture is found, because there's a concern here that he might have fractured his hip, for example. And that's a major issue and um, would need hospitalisation. So what's the real diagnosis here? Well, one diagnosis might be there's nothing wrong with him. You'll hear this kind of speak. Certainly early in my career, this would have been the kind of response. Another diagnosis that's often used in this circumstance is acopia. This man's not coping. He's, he's uh, not got a medical problem. He's got a social problem. Or he doesn't need an expensive hospital bed. My goodness, we know we've got ambulances ramping out the front and this man is occupying a space, so we don't want to put him in the hospital because there's nothing wrong with him. And then uh, maybe if he had an advanced directive, he wouldn't have turned up at all. So let's make sure that he's got one so that he elects not to have hospital care if he gets sick. So these are the kind of... This sort of rhetoric goes on quite a bit in the system. Thankfully, not as much as it used to. Things are getting better. But this is the kind of reaction you get with this kind of problem. Now, what's really wrong with this man? Probably he's had some kind of soft tissue injury. He's strained something, pulled, pulled the ligament, or he's got a bruise or something. Just enough to tip him away from being able to walk to being chair fast, at least for a period of time. So I'll talk at the end of my talk about what really should happen to this man, but in the meantime, I'll talk about some of the research that we've done and some of the thinking I have about how hospital care should be delivered to people like this. So why do we care about cognitive impairment in relation to hospitals? And basically, why does it matter? Well, it really matters to people with dementia and their families. And the reason it matters is that hospital care is often required. People with dementia are reasonably vulnerable relative to the general population are much more likely to end up in hospital, not so much to do with the dementia, but the other problems that they tend to have. And many people perceive that the hospital experience is really intimidating for people with dementia. Things easily go wrong. And there's a perspective, a perception that the hospitals are not really designed well to look after people with cognitive impairment. Now, clinicians are, are concerned about this problem because it's difficult to look after people with dementia. It adds another level of complication to the management of whatever problem they have. It's not easy to do this kind of work, even in the best of circumstances. And these people, uh, as you would know, have reasonable opportunity to be treated well and to recover, but it's not as easy as with people who've got normal cognitive function. So clinicians are challenged and interested to do this better. And administrators are interested in this problem because people with dementia have a more complicated recovery path. They often present with more complicated problems. They stay longer and they cost more to provide care, and understandably so. So there's a number of stakeholders here that are interested in this problem, and so it's one that deserves some research, it deserves uh, some thinking about how to manage the problem better. <clears throat> so we've done a series of pieces of work to try and understand at least the extent of the problem. So one study we did, which is a big international study, we looked at the uh, 
the prevalence of dementia and related problems in, in seven countries uh, in 13 emergency departments amongst people aged over 75. And about 40% of the people that turn up to emergency departments pretty much in every country have already got some kind of geriatric syndrome. And if we can, when we talk about geriatric syndromes, we mean things like having cognitive problems, uh, incontinence, mobility issues, propensity to fall and so forth. This is what geriatricians call geriatric syndromes. And so this is almost the majority will already have these kind of problems. And, um, and most will have one of these syndromes when they present to the hospital. So these kind of problems are the majority of patients, not the minority of older people that turn up to hospital. And amongst this population, around 20% probably have got dementia or some related problem before they get sick. And at, 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 at attendance, about a quarter will have cognitive impairment. Some of them will have acquired delirium in the course of their acute illness. And I'll talk a little bit more about delirium in a moment. So when I talk about cognitive impairment, I'm talking about some kind of disturbance of cognitive function, which may be dementia or it may be just a short acute event called delirium. And making that distinction is quite important because the outcomes and the management are quite different. So, so another piece of work we did was in the transition care program. This program provides care for people at home after they leave hospital, mostly of a rehabilitation nature. But it, its target population are often people with fractures or have had a stroke or some kind of event from which uh, some home therapy is required and additional support for a period of up to three months after discharge. It, Australia is lucky to have this program. It's a fabulous program and we should be proud of it. It's not present in many countries. Uh, but amongst this population, around 30% of the people that enter it have dementia. And pr prior to having been admitted to hospital, about 14 or 15% would have had dementia. So quite a number have acquired dementia through the hospital process as they proceed into this post post-hospital program. So, so new onset of dementia is often associated with a hospital episode. It's, you know, big illness just tips people over from being more or less okay to not quite being okay. This is, so the hospital process is associated with major acute illnesses and often changes in cognitive function that don't recover. So hospitals are a very important environment when you think about how one's brain is uh, being looked after. And about 10% uh, of this population have some residual features of delirium, uh, still not recovered when they leave hospital. That may or may not be a good or a bad thing. That's a discussion that we often have. Um, what about people that actually get into hospital? We did a, quite a big study a few years ago looking at um, uh, how many people in hospital actually have dementia. And, you know, people would perceive it's a small percentage, but when we studied about 500 people admitted who are aged over 70, uh, we did quite a, I won't go into the details of how we did this, but essentially uh, about 30% of people that get into medical wards, this is what we call general medicine, have dementia. This is a substantial number of people. It's not, the, not a small minority. Even in the surgical wards, which tend to have somewhat fitter patients, uh, it's about 15, 16%. And in orthopaedic surgery where people with fractured hips find themselves and fractured wrists and so forth, uh, about 15%. So this is a common problem in hospital. It's not exceptional. And the problem of delirium, this is the situation where people become acutely confused. Obviously, people, well, you may not know, but people who already have brain dysfunction dementia are much more vulnerable to getting delirium than people with normal cognitive function. So one of, the, one of the big issues for people who go to hospital who get sick, who have already got dementia, is the risk that you'll get this you know, severe acute confusional state. And that just compounds the problem for everybody concerned. And so at about 10, we found that about 10% of patients that are over 70 who come to hospital will have delirium at arrival and another 
five to 10% will acquire it um, sometime subsequently during the hospital episode. And uh, it's, a, it's an important problem because it's difficult to manage and it's often badly managed because it's so difficult. And uh, there are lots of issues here around how this is managed in terms of some of the agitation and the behavioural problems associated with delirium and, and the dangers that that represents mainly to the patient climbing out of bed, falling over, disturbing others, uh, and then the risk that drugs will be used to try and sedate people, and that's often done somewhat more aggressively than we would like. And, uh, and it's obviously staff intensive to manage people in this state because of their safety concerns, so you need to often have a staff member allocated to one patient. So it's quite costly and the hospitals get concerned about that, understandably. So this is a very complicated problem and it needs a great deal of care to manage it well. So now this slide is kind of uh, illustrates how much of what I'm trying to show in this slide is how much of these problems that are present in hospital are new to the person as a result of their illness, this event and the fact that they're in hospital. So this, this by pre-morbid, we mean what was the person like a few days before they got sick? And at admission means what they're like in the, in the 24 hours after they've been admitted. So problems with cognition, brain function, uh, most of the people that have this problem in hospital already had it before they came in. It's well known. You would like to think it's well known. It's surprising how many people show up to hospital that have got at least mild brain impairment that don't, uh, where, where it's not properly documented. And, um, and then about 20% have delirium. And, well, they won't have delirium before they get sick. But you can see communication problems, uh, having had a fall. Amongst older people in hospital, over 70, some 40% have had a fall in the previous 90 days and some 40% have got bladder incontinence. This is almost the norm for older people who go to hospital. It's not, not an unusual problem. And any problems with activity of daily living, uh, about 20% have already got problems with walking, feeding themselves, personal care, bathing. But that rapidly changes as a result of acute illnesses up to about 60%. And by instrumental ADL, we mean ability to do housework, manage finances, use the telephone and so forth. Just about everybody that comes to hospital has got some limitation with those functions. So older people in hospital are frail. It's not you know, your average fit older person that comes to hospital, it's the people that have got a considerable amount of frailty that pre-exists whatever illness it is that they are, that brings them to hospital. So there's a lot to be thought about when you see these data about how you set up a hospital to look after people. You can't, you know, us old guys like myself, uh, uh, you, you know, I'm not quite there yet, but, you know, we, we're not the typical hospital customer. And if we are, we're in and out in a flash. We might, you know, if I had a heart attack, I'd probably be out in three or four days. But if I was the typical older person, I'd probably be in for quite a time. So this is, this, this slide shows what's new and really um, at admission and at discharge. So Really, the problems that, are, that happen to people uh, when they come in hospital is that their personal care abilities kind of fail when they get sick. And that happens to all of us, of course, but it happens more to, veil, uh, to frail people. And some people newly acquire bladder incontinence and bowel incontinence, but really not too much change in cognitive function. There is some, but uh, some people do really go backwards in these, this setting, but, but not, not that many. Now, and, and then this, this slide uh, shows what the severity of the dementia is amongst those that have got cognitive impairment. And uh, if, you, if you drew the same chart for people that live in residential care, um, this, this group here, the, this severe group would be right up here. 
that would be the majority. Uh, but in the hospital population, it's mainly people with mild to moderate dementia that, that we see in the hospital setting. So um, this group here, you know, six means lying in bed, very dependent, unable to feed oneself. Um, it's kind of end stage dementia. Most people in that state are all, all in an aged care facility by the time they progress to that level. So the hospital population has people with mild to moderate dementia predominantly, but they're a vulnerable population for a whole lot of reasons. Now, we did a, some interesting work uh, recently looking at problems not only amongst uh, the older population, but the younger population that come to hospital. And a few things to note here. Cognitive impairment is not absent amongst younger people. So these purple bars are, are the age groups over 70, 80 and 90. But here's young people. But problems with activities of daily living, young people that come to hospital are... Uh, about 30% of them have pro the same problems as older people. And problems with mobility, having had a fall in the last 90 days. Now, it'd be, it's kind of intriguing that, say, this group here, 60 to 69-year-olds, I think that's right, something like 30% uh, of them have had a fall in the last 90 days. So these are what we call geriatric syndromes, but we've found a high prevalence of geriatric syndromes amongst non whoops sorry about that amongst uh, non geriatric people so this this means that some of the things we're thinking about in terms of frail older people uh, and how they should be cared for in hospital would apply to the kind of younger people that come to hospital as well again this at least in public hospitals in australia you don't see fit young people coming into hospital you see people with lots of other problems difficulties so hospitals are increasingly places where even though you might think people are going in with a single diagnosis actually most of the people getting into hospital have got lots of other problems that go with it and this has important implications for how you set up a hospital and how you run it and that's why we're interested in younger people as well as older people. And, whoops, sorry. These are other what we call functional syndrome, problems with how people function. Um, pain is present in about 60 to 80% of people and more prominent in younger people. Reporting mood problems, anxiety and so forth. It's around about 50% of the population have these kind of problems. Lost weight unintentionally prior to hospitalisation, doesn't matter what age, it's the same phenomenon. And use of alcohol, smoking and other things are more common amongst uh, younger people. So all of these kind of problems seem to be endemic in the hospital population right across the board, not just older people. And just what happens to folks with these kind of problems? Now, I'm turning again to older people. Um, but people with, um, what are we saying here? So people with dementia um, are more likely to acquire delirium, something like 15% compared to about 3 to 4% of people without dementia. So this is a very different outcome for people with dementia. The probability of having a fall in hospital is slightly greater for people with uh, dementia. They're more likely to stay in hospital uh, for a longer period of time. I'll say a little bit more about that. And they're more likely to die in hospital. So uh, people with dementia, probably not surprisingly to you, are more vulnerable than those without and uh, have, if you like, if you think about it this way, the outcomes look worse and they cost more to provide care. And this, this is a little bit complicated, but really the point to be made here is the average length of stay goes up as the severity of the cognitive function increases. So, so at least up till moderately severe dementia, the length of stay increases uh, quite substantially. So this is, you know, hospital managers get real excited about bed flows and they, they want people out three minutes after they arrive. And, uh, and 
for any given diagnosis, the folks that have got cognitive impairment are going to be the longer stayers, and appropriately so, they take longer to recover. But they become the target of the bed managers because they stay longer than the average, if you understand. So if, if, if you don't see what goes on when you're a patient in hospital, but behind the scenes is an army of people trying to get people out. And there's a queue out. You know, the ambulances are ramping up the front and Channel 7's watching all of this. And, uh, and so they're out there trying to... And so obviously the pressure gets applied to the most vulnerable population in hospital because they stay longer for their given problem. And this, this creates a lot of anxiety amongst many of us in terms of getting appropriate care delivered to these people. And uh, finally, this last bit of statistical stuff. Um, this is, you remember those slides I showed about the list of functional problems, one of which is cognitive impairment. But uh, if you count the number of problems that people have, walking problems, smoking, can't sleep, depression, all those kind of functional and social type problems, the more you have, the longer you stay. To the point where if you've got 10 of these problems, you tend to stay on average about eight and a half days compared to the average for around about four and a half days. So, so this becomes an issue for the funders. You know, I was in Queensland Health talking about this yesterday. They don't actually record this stuff properly. It's hard to find out who's got dementia in hospital according to the, the statistics. They don't record it well. And all of these other functional problems are really poorly, poorly recorded. They're clearly very important in terms of not only providing the care, but also understanding why the system functions the way it does. Why do some people stay longer than others? It's often explained by all these other issues that are not well documented in the medical statistics. But we're working on this. This is a lot of the work that we're doing uh, to try and understand these patterns. And when you understand them, you become more sympathetic. When you understand what's going on, you manage it better. This is why it's so important to understand these things. So can we do any better than we're doing? I painted a rather gloomy kind of view of what happened to that man when he arrived in the emergency department. It was probably more gloomy than what I would say is the average response. But nonetheless, it exemplifies the sort of issues that we're confronted with. So there is pretty good evidence that you can reduce the risk or reduce the incidence of delirium amongst people who are vulnerable by managing the care appropriately. I'll come to how you do that in the next slide. There is no magic bullet around these things. It's often a multi-dimensional, multi-faceted strategy that's needed and a lot of simple things that people would assume would be taken for granted but are not. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. So you can do something about this vulnerability to getting delirium which you would really like to avoid if you could. And similarly in surgery, obviously folks that have hip replacements or fractured hips and so forth are very exposed to the risk of getting delirium. There's pretty good evidence that good management can reduce that risk by at least half. So there are some things that can be done about delirium. Um, if cognitive impairment is identified properly, and it's not done well, although there's a huge effort going on in Australia to do it well now, but up till now, even recognising... I'll tell you my, my story. So my dad, just to talk to anecdotes, he, he's no longer with us either, <laughs> died at 86 and he played golf till three days before he died and at the, uh, at, the, uh, at, he, at the 18th hole he went to pick up the ball out of the, out of the cup and kept going and then died three days later. That was a pretty good outcome. And he had good cognitive function. He was perfectly normal till the day he died. About three years before he died, he had a hip replacement that got infected. It became septic and he was, um, and I, I was living here and he's, down in Melbourne, and uh, he went to the uh, emergency department at one of the large hospitals there and uh, in, a, in a kind of febrile, toxic state. And I, I, being a physician, rang and asked to speak to him and to the doctor looking after him and uh, kind of got through and they, they, they handed the phone to him and I started talking to him and realised it wasn't him that I was talking to. So the staff couldn't figure out who my dad was, even though... He, he, it was very clear. So th that was the first kind of alarm bell that went off. 
But he, when I did get to talk to him, he seemed fine. A few hours, they arranged for him to be admitted to a private hospital nearby, and I rang about four or five hours later to and spoke to the nursing staff that evening about how he was going, and uh, and I asked, um, how, how's he going? And they said, well, you know, it's difficult to tell he's got dementia. Right, so I go, yeah, right. Like yesterday, he was completely normal. And uh, in fact, he developed, because he had a very septic hip, he developed delirium. And, but the staff couldn't even figure out the difference between delirium and dementia. And he was basically consigned to the dementia category, which is, you know, you get, I know there'll be people here that have got relatives with dementia and some of you may have dementia, but, you know, when that label goes up on your medical record, you've got to be mighty careful that your interests are looked after because there's some assumptions being made by some staff that you can't be consulted and that you're basically in, in a difficult-to-treat category. We have to be very careful about this. Uh, this... This kind of thing is really, really important to manage properly. It seems a simple thing, but it is actually a huge challenge. So I've seen this firsthand with my family, and I see it with patients all the time, kind of mislabeling and then inappropriate attitudes to what needs to happen next because of the problem of dementia. One of the interesting things, just to digress a little more, people would say people with dementia don't really do well in rehabilitation. But in fact, from what I can see of the evidence, people without dementia kind of get themselves better with many problems. But the people who really benefit from rehab are the people that can't get themselves better, and that's people with cognitive impairment. So actually, there's a case to be made for giving preference to people with dementia in rehabilitation units as opposed to people who haven't got dementia. That's a big statement. But there's something to be thought about there. And then, of course, uh, there are all these intangible things like appropriate sensitive care does a lot to engender confidence in family members and the patient, and that actually changes the outcome. People that get uncertain about what's going to happen, if there's a poor relationship between the treating staff, the hospital and the patient, often bad decisions are made about the outcome, for example this person needs to go into care in a thoughtless and rapid way when actually there are many other ways of solving the problem. So this sounds a bit soft, but actually it's really incredibly important. So what does good care look like? I should be just stopping now. Someone's going to... Am I right? Sorry, I got excited. So <laughs> we need to know who these people are. I'll be quick. There need to be good preventive strategies for delirium. The physical environment needs to be appropriate for people with dementia, and that's a lot of them. So the hospitals need to be built with this in mind. Family members should be encouraged to be involved rather than not. It's really important. So we should be thinking about family members in the same way as we think about husbands when women give birth. Where is the accommodation for the family when these problems arise? We should be aware that these people don't announce their problems like pain like other people. And we should promote engagement with others, early mobility, adequate nutrition and hydration. And we should think carefully about how we're going to manage the discharge plan. And I'm sorry I've run out of time. I'm going to go to the last slide. No, I'm going to say some, some good things. So we now have the emergence of elder-friendly emergency departments. It's happening worldwide and in some places in Australia. We have good assessment services in some ED departments. This is a huge plus. We have new assessment technologies, ability to identify problems and plan their care, work we're doing within BDHP. We have a program called Eat, Walk, Engage that, that encourages some of the things I talked about earlier to promote recovery and to minimise the complications and prevents delirium. We have, at the governmental level, a standard called comprehensive care that mandates that hospital provide good care for this kind of people. This is fabulously new. And it's recognition at the highest level that we need to do better. And that will drive change in hospitals. This is really excellent. This is a bad slide. 
I don't think I'll do this. This is the stuff that really we need to think about. These things all have their pluses and minuses. Keep people out because the beds are expensive. Should only be for car accidents. Hospitals are not designed properly. They should be looked after somewhere else. Where would that be? Where is that place? What have we built? What have we constructed for this large and growing population of people that don't quite fit the bill for the traditional hospital? Better to look after, it's true, but that's easier said than done. You live by yourself, your family are in Sydney. What's the plan? They block beds. Young people block beds as much as old people, by the way. You shouldn't take that too easily. <laughs> Nobody should be in hospital. Everybody can be compared. It's not, not, not just old people we have to think about. So Mr AB, so he should have a comprehensive assessment needed just to make sure we're not missing something really important. We also need to understand his circumstances, his function and who could care for him at home. That needs to be appraised properly. The diagnosis needs to be clear. Could he go home? That needs to be thought through intelligently and, and caringly. If he can't go home, he needs to get into a, what we call a subacute unit, a particular type of ward that looks after people like this, not, not mixed up with surgical patients and people that have got other problems. And we should do all of these things, proper pain management, injury prevention, delirium prevention or functional restoration, proper nutrition and hydration, diligent discharge preparation, discussions, careful discussions with family members, post-discharge monitoring support and contemplation about long-term care. There's a lot there. There's a lot of work. It can be done well. Some people are doing it very well. That's the way I'm thinking we are and where we're going in regard to hospital care of older people. Hopefully you found that useful. I hopefully I've given you some insights and hopefully I've, I've encourage you that the things are being done and things are substantially getting better, but we are mid-journey at the moment. Thank you very much. I, I think it would be fair to say that um, we would have a whole session <laughs> of question and answers um, from Professor Gray if we had more time. It's amazing, um, the work that you're doing. So thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, everyone. I do have to get back to Mount Cooper <laughs> to the rarefied air. But I really appreciate the invite today. And thank you, Lynn. That was fascinating. Scary, but fascinating as well. But I appreciate you listening to me today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, during lunch, I'm sure there'll be time to ask some of our speakers any questions or further discussion you'd like to. But to keep us on track for our lunch break at 12 o'clock, I'd like to introduce um, our next speaker, Professor Jürgen Goetz, who is the director of the Clem Jones Centre for Ageing Dementia Research. Jürgen, thank you. Yeah, good morning, everyone. So I'm trying to develop a line of argumentation just to justify what we are doing in the lab. So basically starting with a fundamental question, what is dementia? And so I try to make a case for what we are actually doing within the center. So let's see. So let me start with a general question, what is dementia? So dementia is a general term for decline in mental ability, severe enough as we have learned just from a Professor Glenn's talk, uh, talk to interfere with daily life. And I've picked this figure, which is taken from a Lancet published only two years ago, which basically looks at the risk factors for dementia. When you look at anything which is colored, these are factors which are potentially modifiable. So we start with early life, education is an issue. When we move, when we move to midlife, hearing loss, hypertension and obesity are modifiable risks. And as we get older, we are talking about smoking, depression, sorry, physical inactivity, social isolation, diabetes. So 35% approximately is modifiable, but we are also aware that some things are not modifiable. For example, our age or our family history or genetics. And we are all aware that as you get older, 
the risk of developing dementia increases, and there's an issue with, uh, with a reduced life, ex with an increased life expectancy, and at the same time, there's a drop in birth rates. Now, when we look at the aging population, we are also aware that the population is aging. In Australia, approximately 60% of the population is above the age of 65, and again, this figure is increasing. It's not as bad as in Germany, where I come from, <laughs> where, where we are sitting in the 20 to 30% brackets. Now, I picked this slide because it nicely illustrates what the hallmarks are of aging. So basically, there is this wheel, and we have nine hallmarks of aging, what aging means at a cellular level. So we talk about genomic instability, telomere attrition. Telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes, and it's Elizabeth Blackburn, who is Australia-born. She was awarded the Nobel Prize for figuring out what's happening to these ends. And I will come back to some of these themes. But importantly, I want to mention that this holds true for our entire body, but it holds true in particular for neurons. And the reason is that the cells in the brain don't, they don't become replenished. So basically, we are born with these neurons and they stay there, most of them, for the entire lifespan. So we're exposed to all these aging impacts, and there's no escape for them by replenishing or by, by going through cell division. We have been talking about Alzheimer's disease. We are aware that it is the most important form of dementia, but it's also important to make the point that there are other dementias, and this figure nicely illustrates, and it's not talking about motor diseases, that when you look at dementia, that Alzheimer's disease, which is shown here in red, accounts for 50 to 75% of all cases. We've got frontal temporal dementia accounting for 5 to 15% of all cases, Dementia with Lewy bodies, accounting for up to 7.5% of all cases, and then this big blue chunk here of vascular dementia. Now, when you look at, for example, Alzheimer's disease, approximately 95% or even more, maybe 99% is sporadic, and 1% to 5% is inherited. And when we look at the gene mutations, all mutations are linked to amyloid. To one mutation, uh, a set of mutations is in the amyl precursor protein, a gene, and it's the amyl precursor protein from which a beta is derived, and the bulk of the other mutations are in the presenilin genes, and all three genes are linked to amyloid formation. But again, this only accounts for 5% of all cases. And likewise, for frontotemporal dementia, we have a segment which is sporadic, and a much smaller segment which is inherited, so where there is a family history. So importantly, as a rough ballpark figure, 5% of all these diseases have a family history, and approximately 95% is sporadic, and Alzheimer's disease is the most important form of dementia. Coming back to this wheel where I have shown you the nine hallmarks of aging, I would come, like to come to this magenta bit of uh, this, this hallmark, which is shown in Magenta, is called loss of proteostasis. And we all know that our body is made up uh, to a large part of proteins, when you think of insulin or growth hormone or tau or amyloid. And these proteins fold, and they have to fold properly in order to execute their normal function. And in principle, for any of these proteins, there are four modes of what can happen to them. So let's think we have a protein. This protein is subjected to a form of stress. Think of radic uh, for oxidative radicals, for example, um, or oxidative stress, when you think of heat shock, of, of different forms of stress. This can cause a protein to unfold. And then there are cellular mechanisms, and I'm not going into much detail, called autophagy and proteasomal de degradation, which basically allow this unfolded protein to be digested and removed. Another option a cell can deal with unfolded, potentially toxic proteins is by refolding it. And for this we have chaperones. We basically fold the protein back and it assumes again its normal, its normal size and form. And yet another possibility, and that is what is happening in all forms of neurodegenerative diseases, is that the protein cannot be removed, it cannot be refolded. In fact, what's happening is it aggregates. And this is shown on the right. And this is a mechanism which happens during aging, and it's a mechanism which is augmented during pathological aging, such as Alzheimer's disease. 
And now in Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia or Parkinson's disease, in all of these diseases, we do have signature proteins that accumulate in specific brain areas. And because they accumulate in these specific brain areas, this leads to clinical features which reflect an impairment of a normal function of these specific brain areas. So when we look at the brain as a whole, so we've got these different lobes, for example, the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is an area which has a role in word production, in problem solving, planning, in emotion. And when there is an impairment of the frontal lobe, this leads to changes in behavior, in speed, and in mood. And incidentally, these are functions which are impaired in frontotemporal dementia. So in frontotemporal dementia, we got language variants, we got behavioral impairments, and as the name indicates, frontotemporal dementia, the same changes also happen in the temporal cortex. And the temporal cortex has a role in word understanding and emotion. So again, when these proteins aggregate in the temporal cortex, it leads to a specific form of disease, frontotemporal dementia, with a specific form of language impairment. And then again, we can look at the hippocampus, which we know has an essential role in memory formation and learning. When you have proteins aggregating there, this leads to dementia, as is the case for Alzheimer's disease. This is a figure taken from a paper by Adriano Aguzzi. He is from Zurich. So he has been working on prion disease and mad cow disease. So I know him very well. So I've picked this figure from one of his review articles. And I would like you to focus only on the bottom right-hand corner, the one which I marked in red. And you see there a protein called alpha-synuclein. Now alpha-synuclein aggregates in Parkinson's disease and it does so in the substantia nigra. And for that reason, it causes Parkinsonism, it causes Parkinson's disease. However, when this protein alpha-synuclein aggregates in the basal ganglia, because this is a different brain area which is impaired, this causes multiple system atrophy, so it causes Parkinsonism and or ataxia. Now again, when one finds alpha-synuclein aggregating over the entire brain in the cortex, this leads to yet another disease called dementia with Lewy bodies. So it leads to dementia. So depending on where these proteins aggregate, this leads to specific clinical features and impairments. So when we think of Alzheimer's disease, and some of you have seen this slide before, in Alzheimer's disease we have tau aggregating in nerve cells and amyloid aggregating in uh, outside the nerve cells in the interstitial space. It's starting in the hippocampus, then spreading in the cortex, hence we have mostly memory impairments. And interestingly, I referred before to these familiar cases, mutations have been identified in genes, such as the amyloid precursor protein coding gene, which are intimately linked to a beta production. And then we got a subset of frontotemporal dementia called frontotemporal lobal degeneration tau. And in this group of disease, there's a mutation in the tau encoding gene. So basically we got the histopathology, tau aggregates, amyloid aggregates in an Alzheimer's brain, and we got this genetic evidence, mutations in these genes. So together we have uh, histopathological evidence, but also genetic evidence, and both point to a beta and tau initiating and driving disease. And for that reason, we are targeting amyloid and tau. We can also think of an overarching theme. So basically we have these signature proteins in the different diseases accumulating in different brain areas leading to specific clinical features or impairments. But we can also think of a general theme. And the general theme is, yes, in Alzheimer's disease, you have mutations in the APP gene and in the presenilin genes leading to amyloid and tau. This leads to aggregations. This leads to protein misfolding, plaques and tangles. But the same happens in Parkinson's disease, the same happens in Huntington's disease, the same happens in ALS, the same happens in frontotemporal lobar degeneration. So there is an overarching theme arguing that if we find, when we find a way to prevent the formation of insoluble protein aggregates generally, you would have a means of intervening with this pathological process in all of these diseases. So we could ask, how can we stop this process? So in principle, there are two ways of removing or getting rid of these protein aggregates. One is to prevent their formation in the first place, and the other is to basically remove them, clear them, 
once they have formed. When you think of tau, this is from one of our review articles, you can start with the, with the RNA, so with the genetic information, this is translated into the protein, the protein has a physiological function, it binds to microtubules, it becomes post-translationally modified, it's a monomer, it forms a dimer, it forms an oligomer, it forms a fibril, the fibril fills up the entire soma of the degenerating neuron, the structure is called neurofibrillar tangle, and in principle you can interfere at any of these steps, but you can also interfere with a process once this has formed by trying to activate autophagy or the proteasome and help these cellular control uh, processes to work better and to clear amyloid or tau. And we are both pursuing both lines of investigation. So how does the clinical trial landscape look like? We know, and all of you know, there have been more than a hundred clinical trials and so far everything has failed, which is really it's heartbreaking and it's disappointing. And this is from 2018, but in the meantime, for example, aducanumab, which is listed here as a phase three uh, drug, has been, has been, the trial has been halted, it has been stopped, and I will come to that. We got the same landscape, a bit less comp, let me go back to that. So you see when you look at the color coding, red and blue, most of these strategies are targeting amyloid and tau. Um, when we think of frontotemporal dementia, this is from uh, one review I have co-authored, again, multiple strategies to tackle the problem, and still of these strategies are still ongoing, but so far there is no cure. Now what has happened on the 21st of March this year? You all know that aducanumab, a very promising trial, an antibody targeting a beta, had to be, that the trial had to be halted, not because amyloid was not cleared, although we are still waiting for the data to be revealed, so that the analysis is still ongoing, but because the primary endpoint of improving, or not, not improving cognition, slowing the cognitive decline has not been met. This strategy is an antibody trying to clear amyloid or the plaques once amyloid has formed. Now, interestingly, when you look at the dates, this is the 21st of March, this is the 22nd of March, only one day later, the same company announced that they pursue, that they continue with a second trial, which basically uses the same underlying principle, using an antibody targeting amyloid. This antibody is called BAN2401, and it's kind of a rare situation that you have a company basically having two expensive uh, billion dollar programs uh, uh, in their portfolio. And the simple reason is that Biogen acquired ISI and they had to develop this antibody. So there's still hope. But I also want to illustrate the challenge with what we're trying, trying to, 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 to solve. And as a consequence of this, or it's basically happening in parallel, a new way has been developed, a new principle, and um, to come up with a biological definition of Alzheimer's disease. Not saying we, let's, let's say you have a patient that you want to look at reducing amyl and tau, and when you look at this Venn diagram and look at this green, green circle here and the red circle, you see Alzheimer's disease, we, we, we are now defining Alzheimer's disease not only as something which has tau and amyloid, hello, <laughs> tau and amyloid, and, um, and, 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 and associated with cognitive impairment, but also when you look at this segment, this is amyloid and tau, no cognitive impairment. So cognitive impairment, as it's said here, is basically used as a symptom of a disease rather than, uh, than a definition of a disease. And that's important for us designing clinical trials. So we are saying we remove amyloid and tau, we cannot promise at this stage that we that we can lead, that we can basically slow down the cognitive decline. So that's important to mention. So what, so why did aducanumab fail? And what are the potential solutions? And the question which can be rightly asked, is a beta the right target? And I still think it is, and I will come to that. Are animal models in which all of this has been developed, which are the foundation for this human work, are they really predictive of a clinical outcome? Yes or no? It's a valid question to be asked. And it also has to be mentioned that when we look at Alzheimer's disease, when we look at brain diseases more generally, we are dealing with a general problem. You know there's a long prodromal phase, there's a long delay from when the disease is initiated biochemically, cellularly, until we actually can capture it and pick it up. There's a lack of biomarkers at the early stages. There's the issue of variability and comorbidity. Someone in Alzheimer's patients has amyloid, has tau, has the TDB43, 
has a, there's a lot happening in the brain, so this makes it really hard. And as you know, we are working on ways to overcome the blood-brain barrier, which is a major impediment to deliver drugs. How can this be overcome? One way to deal with it is to treat earlier and to increase the dose. Another way to deal with this is to develop new drugs, targeting the synapse, targeting mitochondria, targeting apolipoprotein E, which is, the, which is the most important risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, or also targeting inflammation. I mean, as you know, we are developing therapeutic ultrasound, which can help in this. So I have come up with nice, I always come up with a different schemes kind of to, to allocate people within CJ Cadra into different areas. And this is a new scheme, but I kind of like it. So coming back to this review on the nine hallmarks of aging, so I allocated Per Bartlett's team to the stem cell corner. So he's working in the stem cell sector. A lot of us work on intercellular communication, pre-synapse, groups of Meunier, Colson, and Who, post-synapse, my group, Angona and Opaso, Glia, group of Medeiros, Axon, group of Hilliard, and mitochondria, a general theme, and Stephen Zurim working, working in this space. We work on different projects, we trans and we will soon hear about our translation efforts around ultrasound. That's the most advanced. We are also working on developing antibodies. And obviously, we have a basic research around synapses, around mitochondria. And this hopefully will also lead to translation outcomes. So in order to understand pathological mechanisms in Alzheimer's disease, in my own team, we develop animal models. So we use... We generate transgenic mice by injecting genetic material which is taken from human patients into, the germ, into, into mouse oocytes. It's a, very, it's a very delicate procedure, as you can imagine. We inject one to two picoliters of DNA. It's a very tiny, tiny amount with a micromanipulator. This goes into the nucleus. The DNA integrates. The oocytes are put back into a foster mother. Three weeks later, pups are born and some of them are transgenic. So one way, what, for example, how we go about, for example, to introduce a Swedish mutation found in a Swedish family with early onset Alzheimer's disease and mutation in the AMI precursor protein gene, a so-called Swedish double mutation. So we make these mice by introducing this mutation into the germline of mice, and we generate an APP Swedish mouse. This mouse and this is only a scheme, as it gets older, develops lots of lots of aminal plaques in its brain. The plaques in the mouse, shown on this brain section, are similar to what we find in humans, and similarly we are able to introduce a p 3 o one l mutation found in familiar cases of frontotemporal dementia in the tau gene into the germline of mice, and we are able to reproduce neurofibrillar tangle formation with billions of tau filaments in their cells in these mice. <coughs> we can, depending on which type of mutation we introduce, and this is all work from my lab, so we can either reproduce filament formation, this is an electron micrograph. We can also take the pores of a mouse and use a little bit of paint and let them walk, and you see that this mouse models Parkinsonism, so it has a reduced step length, and Parkinsonism characterizes a significant subset of patients with frontotemporal dementia, or we can even model the behavioral impairments, such as increased impulsivity and reduced social interactions. You see this, the mice, how they interact. wild type mice, they are close together. And uh, here, the transgenic mouse maintains some distance to, to its fellow mouse in this cage. So we can model a lot of these human traits in the mice. And so we have tools in which to test therapeutic interventions and I only will talk quickly about ultrasound before handing over to Rachel de la Hiras. This is basically a timeline showing how we started. I was recruited to QPI, um, and we conceptualized the idea, and then basically started showing that ultrasound can be used to clear amyloid and tau in the respective mouse models and also restore memory functions. So basically starting with Alzheimer models, moving to healthy mice, showing that the approach is safe, moving the mice, and I come to that, and then at the same time, recruiting engineers into the lab and working together with engineers, basically to build this knowledge base which allows us to move forward and to eventually go into clinical trials. So the green bar indicates how long it took us to start the study and get it published. And 
just to give you a very short, I have only two or three more minutes left before I hand over, just to give you an idea of ultrasound in general. So we operate in a parameter space, so we can play with the pressure. It's like like uh, uh, like like with 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 the, with, with the amplitude of the sound, and also with the frequency. Uh, uh, so we can. <laughs> I don't want to go even. I don't want to go higher. Huh? Uh, I could go higher, though. <laughs> okay. So basically, depending on what we do, we can use ultrasound, as you know, just to to see how the baby grows, and then we're all is fine. We can use it in physiotherapy just to induce some tissue heating. We can use it to treat patients with, who had undergone a stroke. We can even destroy gall and liver stones, which is amazing. Ultrasound is improved for the ablation, as far as brain applications are concerned, of, the, of tissue in the thalamus to treat essential trauma, an absolutely remarkable and effective approach. And it's also used as a neuro, as neuromodulator tool. And I made a joke in the past. I don't say that I, I leave it. I leave it there. So we basically we use we applied ultrasound in combination with microbubbles, a contrast agent, to plug forming mice. We inject. We, we we use a transducer, an ultrasound transducer. We inject microbubbles, a contrast agent. Microbubbles go into the brain capillaries. Ultrasound interacts with the microbubbles. They expand and contract. This exerts a pressure onto the blood vessels, they open, and you can get anything in, such as a drug, but also a dye. And you see here, we can, for example, open the, blood, the brain for a dye. And so suddenly we have a, a bluely stained brain. So we applied this mode using a scanning ultrasound approach, scanning ultrasound as a means of branding what we are doing. So we are sussing a brain, we are using ultrasound. We treated with Alzheimer's mice five to seven times, having an appropriate control, analyze them, found that we can remove amyloid shown here in black on these brain sections to see this black standing here. It's mostly gone in the sussed mouse. And I don't show you a lot of data. I just want to say that the underlying principle is that what you have in your brain is so-called brain waste removal cells. So I basically remove anything which is building up, the amyloid and the tau, but somehow in an Alzheimer's brain they are not effective. So somehow, by opening the blood-brain barrier, things get into the brain and they activate these dormant microglia cells. And when we do that job, you see here, when we, when we stain for amyloid in red and the microglia in green, as soon as we apply ultrasound, the colors merge. What does this mean? It means that the amyloid is taken up into the microglia and digested. And this is illustrated here nicely visually by having this merge of red and green into red, uh, red and green into yellow, sorry, red and green into yellow. And basically we showed that all of this goes along, not only with the removal of amyloid, but we are also able to restore cognitive functions fully in free complementary tests. And that was absolutely exciting for us. We didn't expect that. Gerhard Lenenga, I don't know, he's in the audience, most likely he's working in the lab, which is great. <laughs> so... Often we are asked, is there any progress? Yes, we have published more in the space. We had a paper last year. We have just submitted another paper. So working in this space, we also moved to tau mice. We basically show that we can deliver an antibody into the brain and also into the nerve cells. And we do this by labeling the antibody against tau fluorescently. You see here, when we combine the antibody with ultrasound, it's not only taken up by the nerve cells, it's actually going into all its corners. It goes into the cell body, but also distributes into, into the dendrites. So it's absolutely amazing to see what we achieve with ultrasound. We published this um, in 2017. We also found that we can uh, treat mice multiple times, that we can even restore or help them in their motor functions, not only memory functions, but also motor functions. But you have to do more treatments. It takes longer. Tau is a much harder target to treat than a beta. And we also showed that ultrasound is safe. So after multiple studies, basically we take the mice, treat them, and then we use the excellent capabilities we have here at UQ. And we have used the imaging facility across the door, basically done in a collaborative effort, basically showing that the method is absolutely safe because it's tunable. We can make it unsafe, but we can tune it to make it safe. We have moved to sheep for a simple reason that the mouse is really tiny. When you look at the brain, it's even tinier. 
<laughs> it's just unbelievable. We think that mouse is more than human, but it only does so to some extent. You see, this is a mouse brain. I don't know whether you can see this from the back, it's so small. But this is a human brain in comparison, with, and a goat or sheep sits in between. So we use sheep because we have so many here in Australia. <laughs> That's one of the reasons. <laughs> But importantly, because the skull attenuating properties are similar to human, and ultrasound uh, is attenuated by skull, you see, of all, oh, sorry, of all species, the sheep comes closest to humans in terms of skull properties. So we use sheep. We do lots of simulations in the lab. We can open the blood brain barrier in sheep, and we actually know where we open, and it's, it's safe, and, and, and we can repeat this. We have even been able, sorry, we have even been able to use gadolinium contrast MRI to visualize blood brain barrier opening in the sheep. You see, this is the sheep. Doesn't it look cute? <laughs> it does. I always think it does. It looks so peaceful. We got a, we got a golden retriever at home. It always looks the same. Um, so that was my last data slide. I would like now to hand over to Dr. Rachel De La Hira. You see it in program. So she holds a PhD in molecular neuroscience and has been working in a commercial and translation setting. We are really grateful that she joined our team, and things are really booming at the moment. So she is, has worked for the product development commercialization pathways, and she's working with my team, and she is talking about our translation aspects. So. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And wow, so wonderful to see so many of you here today. Um, and your participation here and your donations are really instrumental to all of the translation work that we've been doing. Um, so I know quite a few of you, of you are here uh, really interested to hear about when we're going to start the first in human trial. So I want to talk through um, the work that we've been doing to build a medical device using therapeutic ultrasound and to talk through what we're actually doing currently um, towards getting to the clinic and hopefully by the end so that my goal by the end um, or by lunchtime today is that you really have a really good and deep understanding of where we're at and um, how close we are. So Jürgen described uh, therapeutic ultrasound for treating Alzheimer's disease. And um, a lot of what I'm going to talk to is really around the timeline of where we've come from. And I'd like to um, bring you along that timeline to help us celebrate some of the, the wins we've had along the way as we get towards the clinic. And so one of the reasons that we undertook to actually develop a medical device is that there is no device capable of doing what we need ultrasound to do uh, for this particular um, treatment um, approach. So as you're aware, um, Jürgen and uh, his PhD student at the time, um, Gerhard, so in 2015 published um, their, their work, which has been very highly cited. It's very highly regarded in the field and Internationally, we, we really are thought leaders in the therapeutic ultrasound space, particularly for treating um, Alzheimer's disease and, and other brain indications. And the reason why there is no device available is because we've got very um, specific problem that we need to overcome or, or uh, barrier, and that's the presence of the skull bone. So the traditional use of ultrasound is as a diagnostic, as Jürgen mentioned, for imaging purposes. Um, there are applications of ultrasound that are um, high frequency, looking at using heat to ablate tissue um, and, and other things. So we really are trying to develop a device that has very unique properties. And that means that we have to actually custom make an ultrasound probe. But it's not, not enough to just make a custom um, ultrasound probe or transducer, as I'll interchangeably use those words. We also need to actually develop components and subsystems to allow us to apply that transducer onto a, a, a patient or a participant. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And you know, we are in a, um, a basic research academic setting. So the QBI um, and, and members of CJ Cadre really undertook um, 
this idea of developing this uh, medical device development program from within uh, the Institute, a lot of the reasoning there was behind leveraging all of the skills, the basic science skills that we have here to interface with engineering skills. So the engineering component of device development is actually the easier part. The more complicated part is understanding the biology uh, in order to ask the engineers to build exactly what we need them to build. So I'd like to just talk a little bit about um, the development process. Um, we use this, this scheme, which is um, technology readiness levels. And so this helps us um, identify all of those things that we're doing and how close we are to actually being ready to apply our device or be that a drug or a, um, an actual device to an actual uh, patient for a first in human trial and then how far we are till we're actually market ready, for example. So when we undertake a medical, medical device development program, there are a lot of things in addition to um, the development of the technology itself. There's things that we need to take into consideration around how we're going to actually fabricate the medical device and how we scale and our ability to actually fabricate multiple units of the device. There's a lot of um, work and consideration that needs to be taken into understanding all the different systems that in need to interface with our um, therapeutic transducer. So if you think about um, many of the uh, devices that you might encounter in, in a doctor's surgery or a hospital, there's, there's multiple devices all working um, together to give uh, the doctor or the clinician um, an understanding of what's happening. So we need to be able to integrate into multiple different, um, with multiple different technologies. We also need to, when we're starting to develop a, a device like this, we need to understand the environment and how the environment setting might influence the, de the performance of our device. And then we also need to understand um, the regulator regulatory sort of constraints and enablements that we're going to need to consider as we develop the device. So while we have a, a really big picture vision of this um, device that has a, a lot of functionality and capability, in order to get to a first in human trial as quickly as possible, uh, we've really stri stripped back all the non-essential features of what we want to develop, um, whilst keeping an eye on the future. And so once we're successful in the first in human trial, what, what does the development path look like? And that's all around balancing um, cost of development, time of development, um, meeting expectations. You know, we all have expectations of, of getting to the clinic as soon as possible and really uh, pairing back um, to the absolute essential component of the, the device, which is what we have, we have done. And there's a lot of decisions making that goes on here. And a lot of that decisions, the decisions we make today will impact the, our successes in the future. So there's a lot of work that's done consulting really quite broadly outside of um, CJ Cadre, outside of the QBI, even outside of the university um, setting to, to really bring together all of the best experts um, and advisors that can um, assist us through understanding each of these different um, processes that are vital. So our translation journey, um, as you can imagine, really started with the conceptualization of the device. Um, and that's, so that really starts at technology readiness level one, which is all about conceiving and, and making the initial discovery. And technology readiness level number six is really representative of a device that, that you can take to the clinic. And so that, that's our goal. Now there's a number of other approaches we can um, consider right in the beginning when we're thinking about what does this device need to look like and what features does it need. And one of the first things and decisions we made was around whether we try to build a device that can do many things and so one, the one size fits all um, approach versus a, a personalised approach. 
some of the things um, to consider there is a one-size-fits-all approach is really a, a quite simple and you're just um, going to try and fit a, um, you know, a square peg into a round hole when it comes to trying to get uh, all your patient population to um, be compatible with this particular device because as you can imagine um, the skull being one of the key barriers that we need to overcome the skull properties between individuals is quite variable um, and that's one of the aspects of um, the device development that is being critical to us is how to um, select the right ultrasound parameters to be able to pass through the skull bone um, unimpeded and obviously, trying to start with a personalised approach is quite complex, and that'll add a lot of time to your development and, again, push out our ability to get to a first-in-human trial much later down the track. Obviously, with a one-size-fits-all approach, there's a lot less verification, um, whereas if you're trying to develop very personalised um, solution, so pre-treatment planning for an individual patient. There's a lot of verification requirements um, that, again, adds more time to the development program. And I guess one of the, the risks um, is that a one-size-fits-all approach might have a, a higher failure risk, um, whereas a personalised approach has a much greater success chance and likelihood of success. So we're, when the team are making decisions, it's always a, um, a, a pro versus cons, um, looking at costs versus time. And so a lot of the, the trajectory that we've taken is taking all of these considerations into, into account. But there are things that we can do along the way to help us put evidence behind some of the decision making. And so Jürgen mentioned that we use the sheep the sheep model um, as our experimental species closest to a human and that's really all, all around understanding the physics of the skull um, and the skull bone acoustic properties because they are closest to a human. So we, we undertook to do this work quite early on and this work actually allowed us to make a, a decision as to which approach to use and funnily enough or, or not um, we're taken an approach that kind of sits in between, in between these two. So some parts of the technology development and the application of the technology is personalised and other aspects are a one-size-fits-all approach. And really our goal was to get to a minimum viable product within a two to three year time frame. And that's extremely aggressive and extremely ambitious. So we're, we've um, done very well to get as far as we have um, today, which uh, you'll see as I go along this um, talk. So just to take you back to the timeline, um, the scanning ultrasound um, seminal paper was published in early 2015. Um, and so then through this time, there was a lot of work to raise funding because obviously the traditional competitive grant mechanisms available to us in Australia are really focused at the early um, basic discovery, not discovery, but the basic science work rather than this more applied science translational work. So without the, the donations that we've received, this would not have gone anywhere other than um, a really nice uh, publication in a journal or it would have made progress, but very slowly, certainly not a two to three year time frame. Um, some of the other key aspects that happened through 2015, 2016 was to start assembling a team around this development program. And a, a lot of work has happened through 2017 and 2018. Um, and so the development really commenced in earnest at the beginning of 2017. And that happened when um, we engaged an um, external organisation called Hydrix, um, which is an engineering firm. And so they're a developer of um, high risk, what, what we would consider high risk medical devices. And so they have a lot of engineering expertise um, to take conceptual 
um, ideas and build out the electronics and all of the, the software and mechanical engineering behind that. And then our engineers and our scientists support them by providing them with all of the specifications and the um, underlying um, biology that they need to understand in order to build a device that does what we need it to do. So we've been able to develop a very good and strong uh, collaboration with Hydrix engineering partner. Um, and so through 2017 and 2018, there was a lot of effort, again, built, built into growing the team and building the tools. So, um, you know, not, not only do we have to build a medical device, but we actually need to build um, bench testing equipment and uh, very bespoke rigs that we can use for quality control purposes and understanding whether um, the device we've built actually meets all of our specifications. And so we use these bench testing tools to verify that we've um, actually, our device does what we intend it to do. So um, when we see things like the um, test platform, the Onda tank, um, there's things, there's aspects that we can buy off the shelf, but then there's additional uh, software and um, jigs and things that we need to build in order to make that piece of equipment um, bespoke for our, our um, transducer or our, um, our probe that we're developing. So it's interesting because the program starts to grow much broader than what you originally anticipate. Um, but again, you know, we've been able to uh, make decisions with our um, engineering partner that are always based around uh, fit for purpose and time and cost um, so that we get to the first in human trial as soon as we can. And then we've had to build and verify um, a lot of components that we didn't really consider when we started this work. Um, and so these subsystems, and I'll, I'll show you um, a couple um, examples of those, and then integrate into what we call the clinical unit, which is the one that we'll use in the first in human study. So it's no accident that we do publish a lot of our work. Um, so there, we do deliberately publish quite a bit, and that's all around establishing credibility, um, because these are peer-reviewed peer um, publications. So credibility around not just our device development, but all the methods and techniques we've used to prove that our device um, works the way that we intend. And that comes back to what are we going to be um, submitting as evidence to a human research ethics committee? And what sort of evidence do they want to see around all of the methods that we've used? Because we're establishing these um, from scratch. Um, therapeutic ultrasound is, is relatively new in the field. It's very new in Australia. So when we're engaging with um, ethics committees that are reviewing our protocols to undertake a first in human trial, they want to see that all of our methods are peer reviewed, well established, are verifiable. So we do a lot of work in pursuing um, the, the, what I would call the more basic biology and the publication um, stream, but it is deliberate. So an example of a system that we've had to build, again, scratch, because there is no off the shelf um, commercially available solution is Coupling. So how do we actually couple? We have our tra therapeutic transducer, but how do we actually couple that onto the head? And you can see there are some different concepts in, in the field. Um, so these are systems that will allow us to uh, allow the acoustic energy to pass unimpeded through a fluid medium and into the brain where we need the bioeffect. So not only uh, do we have to develop the therapeutic probe itself, but we, we need to develop all of these sub subsystems. And these are then integrated into the clinical prototype. Another system that we, we didn't contemplate at the beginning of um, the program was how do we position the therapeutic probe 
relative to the skull, so there is no movement. So traditional stereotactic surgery, the uh, stereotactic arc is um, directly screwed into the skull. Our, our mission has always been to develop solutions that are non-invasive. And so again, taking um, ex existing solutions and retrofitting them for our purposes. But like our probe, and it has a Pac-Man over it for a deliberate reason as well, um, but like our probe, we, we need to understand how to interface with these other subcomponents, and then we need to verify how all of these components work together, what sort of tolerances and errors they have. And this is all information that, a, again, a human research ethics committee will want to know. So in terms of clinical trials, what is it that we need to actually do to undertake a clinical trial? Um, it, you know, we, we sometimes complain about animal ethics and, and how tough that can be and rigorous, but human ethics is another level. Um, it's, it's really playing with, with um, you know, the, the mature adults in the room, really. Um, so medical device development has very clear milestones and in Europe and in the USA, they're very well established. Um, you generally have to obtain a pre, um, an investigational device exemption, for example, and you have to submit a lot of evidence uh, for obtaining that. So that's to prove to the regulators that you've developed and fabricated your device under very controlled conditions and that you can uh, fabricate many of these devices, they'll all perform the same, they'll have the same uh, tolerances, specifications. And a lot of this um, in, in, sort of requirements, they're not strictly written into um, the regulations in Australia, but they are still expected. And so when we submit a human uh, ethics application, not only do we need to submit a, a protocol for how we intend to use our device, but we need to submit all of the documentation um, to prove how we've designed and developed the device. Just conscious of time, um, so I'll just skip over. This is just about the TGA, but essentially to run a cl clinical trial in Australia, we need to um, have approval from a human research ethics committee. And if uh, HREC doesn't feel that they have the requisite expertise to comment on the technology components. They'll seek advice from the TGA or from other uh, scientific advisory um, channels. So a lot of what we're doing in this um, sort of currently uh, is all around putting together all of this evidence, documentary evidence, as well as trying to develop out what patients do we want to target with our device? Um, how are we going to use a device in our intended population cohort? Um, as Jürgen mentioned, the disease has a, a long um, phase, sort of incubation phase, uh, for the best term that I can think of. But in that phase, there are many touch points where we could deploy and use a device. So understanding when to actually use a device and how is pivotal to actually having a successful outcome on your clinical trial. So Jürgen mentioned that there's been many clinical trials, they've failed. They haven't necessarily failed because the drug doesn't work or the approach doesn't work. Potentially one of the problems is that the correct patient group hasn't been selected because we lack the biomarkers. Um, or the protocol hasn't been um, designed in a way to give a successful outcome. So whilst it might seem like there's been a lot of failure, we've come a long way and the field, you know, we engage with the field um, quite regularly and everyone's, you know, working together to understand when in, when in the disease course might it be best to intervene um, and what can we do about understanding what biomarkers would be good and what patient um, selection criteria is critical? Because the last thing we'd want to do is build a fabulous device but not be able to demonstrate that it works because we haven't chosen the correct individuals. So really, um, you can see this is the same image as earlier. 
where I've sort of highlighted in red, this indicates the level of our maturity across all of these different um, domain areas. So you can see that we're really getting close to what we would say TRL6. And so we've already commenced work on um, developing out the protocols, understanding what uh, patient stratification um, means in this context. And so we, we are actually un undertaking all the things that we need to be doing to start the first in human clinical trial. Um, so with that, it's almost bang on, on noon. I'd like to thank you and um, invite any questions that anyone in the audience might have. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we have a, um, a mic that um, we can bring to you if you have any questions for Rachel or for Jürgen with regard to the clinical trial, with regard to any of the information they've provided this morning. Thank you.
Um, I, I was um, interested in the situation as far as better amyloid plaque and your tau are the, um, are the problems within the Alzheimer's disease in particular. The removal of it uh, with the, the device that we're talking about, uh, does that regenerate? Does that have the potential to regenerate the neurons and what damage is done by uh, the better amyloid plaque to the brain that uh, stops the neurons from working properly and the synapses so that you're not getting signals through. Now you, you've got the ability to re remove better amyloid plaque and tau, uh, what reconstitutes those damaged neurons to give a form of uh, relief and recovery to the brain. So what I will say, and I'll, I'll hand over to Jürgen because he's probably better qualified, well, much, much I'll better have... qualified to talk to um, <laughs> can those I Can I say aspects? something? I, mm. I, I've talked to Jer Jürgen before and I've got to be up, up close and personal to talk to him because he talks too fast and I don't <laughs> understand him. There you go, Jürgen. You did have to slow it down. So there are multiple mechanisms of action that we're aware of, um, but maybe you yeah. would like to elaborate. Um, you, you see what's happening is that amyloid slowly builds up. So you, you start having a monomer, and then it forms a dimer, and then an oligomer, and eventually plaques. So what the imaging technology allows us to detect are plaques, which is kind of the end stage macroscopic lesion. But obviously the disease initiates much earlier. So it comes back to what I have said, that an issue at the moment is that, that we are lacking biomarkers which would allow us to diagnose disease very early. And in principle, there's a way around that. For example, either by targeting a population, which is where we know they are genetically predisposed to develop Alzheimer's. And there's a kindred in Colombia called the Colombian kindred, and they have a mutation in the presenilin gene and it's approximately, it goes back to a founder effect 200 years ago, where a person had had a mutation and then basically they had kids and grandkids and so on yeah. and so forth. And now we got a big family with 5,000 members. And this is kind of a resource and a lot of clinical trials currently tap into this resource because one knows that whenever is this mutation, patients would develop disease, let's say by 55, 56, 57, so basically you can start treating at, let's say, if you could start treating at 35, not knowing, not having any way to visualize amyloid. So basically you treat early enough. And then as amyloid builds up, let's say with the ultrasound approach, we could potentially clear amyloid during its buildup phase. So we need to, I mean, we definitely need to treat as early as possible. But at the moment, we are only pursuing a safety trial. So we're not dealing with this issue, but as we move into an efficacy trial, we have to either go we use basically such a patient cohort or we would have to use a, a cohort with an APOE allele, where there's APOE, apolipoprotein is a risk factor. Uh, it basically comes, when we look at all of us, we got two, a form which is called two, three, and four. Yep. Three is a common form, two is protective, four is damaging. Let's say if I would have four, four, two, two times a four, my risk to develop Alzheimer's would be eight times higher than the average here. So I, in, I, I would be in a nursing home having Alzheimer's at, down the track. So we, we know this. And basically would, we could tap into this resource, basically do an APOE genotyping and then stratify patients according to the APOE genotype. I meant again, treat as early as possible. But I mean, as Rachel said, there are lots of developments, including in the biomarker space. So uh, this is all happening in parallel. It's like with any invention. I just I like to listen to this innovation podcast, and it talks about the movie industry. Basically, they had to come up with, with ways how to record and with, with the material for film. And uh, all of it, it all comes together. And I think we are in a lucky situation that the time is opportune for us to make these steps forward, but it's happening in an environment which is kind of conducive. The, the protein of, of better amyloid uh, protein is a, is a natural occurrence. It's actually used by the brain. It is, it is. Uh, so it's power. 
it is it's a tau, tau I mean even more tau is a scaffold protein where this kind of stabilizing protein interactions and it's also stabilizing the microtubules which form the cytoskeleton basically the track work of neurons and a beta has a signaling function so it's actually neuroprotective at low doses but at high doses it's damaging it's like with anything in the brain as you get when things get out of proportion it's a normal life and in our body when things get out of proportion things the damage starts and there's much more to be said but most likely yeah we can yeah i hand over to Thank you. Could I just ask if my brain has recorded the summary of this morning's effort so far? I understand that Professor Gotts is focusing on folded protein in amyloid, that he has some medication that would put this right, uh, do what he would like to do to it, but he can't get it into the brain because of the blood-brain barrier and you are now finding ultrasound methods to breach this blood-brain yeah. barrier to allow the medication to get in. That is what my brain has summarized this morning. I think you're absolutely correct. You're doing lots of things. I think that's, that's absolutely correct. So basically, we become... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Be yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I understand that a drug, mannitol, is available to open the blood-brain barrier. I assume you don't use it for a particular reason because your ultrasound project is doing the same thing, but obviously doing a lot more. Could you explain what that extra facility is? Um, mannitol has an effect. It causes swelling, so it's not a, not a healthy approach. The advantage of ultrasound is Besides the fact that it's not calling, causing brain swelling, it's or cell, cellular swelling, the advantage is that we can use it both for focal delivery and global delivery. Let's say you have a patient with frontotemporal dementia and want only to treat the frontal cortex. That's what ultrasound allows us to do. At the same time, we can treat the entire brain. So it gives us this, this flexibility. And besides from that, it's, it's a much safer approach. No one would use mannitol. It's obviously an experimental approach, but not would never go into the clinic. Ah, okay, and, and, and if I'll, do you want to? Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> ultrasound has multiple, I think it's like with aspirin, when I mean, you know aspirin, it has multiple effects. The good thing about ultrasound is, it's, we use it as a blood-brain barrier opening tool, we can use it as a tool to deliver drugs, and we can also, ultrasound in itself, forget about blood-brain barrier opening, it's also a pressure wave. So the pressure wave goes into the brain and on top of having, in conjunction with microbubbles, these blood-brain barrier opening properties, it's a pressure wave which changes the cell membranes, it changes channel activities, it has a lot of neuromodulatory effects and we honestly believe and we have data to show that, that ultrasound is doing much, much more. So it's 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 on top of being a blood-brain barrier opening tool, it's also a neuromodulatory tool. And taking these two things together, I think there's a huge potential for, for brain diseases. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if we just take one more question. I'm conscious of the time. So the gentleman here, if we could. Yeah, hi. Could you um, comment on your anticipated timelines after the safety trial and, and where things go for there and how long it's anticipated to take? So with, the, um, so with the human research ethics submission process, our advice is that um, that committee can take anywhere from six weeks to six months to approve a clinical trial. The first in human safety trial, we're looking at probably being a 12 to 18 months timeline. It really comes back to um, the group of patients that we uh, need to recruit and the recruitment rates. Um, the recruitment for a first in human, well, for any clinical trial is, is done through the clinicians running the trial. So these are, um, so once a, a trial is underway, um, we no longer, it's, it's at arm's length for, from us. Um, and same, same with the time, time frames. In terms of a 
efficacy trial. That's something that will happen after the safety trial has been completed and the data analysed and assessed. Um, so if a first in human trial takes, say, up to 18 months, it would be after, after that time frame. Mm. Ladies and gentlemen, please um, join with me in thanking both Jürgen and Rachel. Um, we, we hope that you will join us for a, a light lunch um, outside on our veranda um, where you'll be able to ask many more questions on a one-on-one. -on -one. And I would ask that if you're rejoining us uh, for the panel discussion this afternoon, we'll be starting um, at quarter to one. Yes, quarter to one, I'm sorry. Um, so if we could be back in the seats around that time so that we can get you out on time as well. Thank you.